Welcome to Behavioral Health Today, a podcast brought to you by the Triad Network. This podcast is designed to share trending topics occurring within the world and our communities and bring them a behavioral and mental health perspective. Welcome to Behavioral Health Today. I'm your host, Dr. Aaron Elmore. My guest today is Ben Bainan. Ben has a master's in marriage and family therapy from St. Mary's University, and he's currently accruing his hours to become licensed. Ben has taken his experience of becoming an MFT and turned it into a blog aptly named Becoming a Therapist, where he writes a bi-weekly newsletter, hosts a podcast, and is building a community to help a beginning therapist grow. And today we're talking with Ben about the process to becoming a therapist and any helpful tips for pre-licensed therapists. Ben, welcome. We're happy to have you here. Yeah, thanks so much. So good to be here. I'm impressed that you even have the time to do all of this while you're earning your license and that you (laughs) were so helpful to create all these resources for people while you're going through such a stressful time. Yeah, it's been uh, an interesting mix of figuring out how much uh, time I want to spend on this and also just being inspired by kind of my own journey and, and what I've gone through. So A lot of that has been motivating beyond just seeing clients and and that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, let's start there. I mean, what really did inspire you to create your Becoming a Therapist blog? Yeah. So it was about a year and a half, almost two years ago. Uh, I'd been practicing, I think, for about a year, year and a half. And it it was kind of a, a mix of circumstances from, you know, starting off as a new therapist during COVID and all that that entailed to myself getting married and that being a big transition and then a couple other kind of family circumstances. All of it sort of led up to me getting burnt out pretty quick, actually. And from that really struggling to balance, you know, helping helping out my clients while also taking care of myself and from that, talking to kind of the limited circle of other people, other beginning therapists that I knew, and hearing that other people were experiencing a lot of similar things, whether it was burnout or just self-doubt or making the transition from being a student to a therapist, a full-time therapist, that sort of thing. So after you know getting some time to take care of myself and kind of recover from that, I think from that was born sort of this desire or motivation to help other therapists or felt like there was at least a need there that other people are struggling to. And if what I've gone through could help, if I could, you know, whether it was through writing or just encouraging other people, then I'd like to do that any way I can. So it started out with just a a blog and it's kind of grown from there as I've figured out what exactly I want this to look like. Yeah. So it sounds like it really was born out of your own experience and your own struggle. And yeah, as you were speaking, I was reflecting back on my time sort of in that process of shifting from school to licensure. And it is a very draining time, even if you don't have all those extra things going on, like getting married and COVID and all that. I remember feeling very burnt out as well. So I think it's a very common time to be despairing (laughs) and to be Mm -hmm. exhausted. So mm-hmm. I think it's great that you're creating these resources for people in that time frame, And obviously you've persisted. You're still on the path towards licensure. So mm-hmm. congratulations on not giving up. Thank <laughs> um, you. Yeah. So you alluded to this, but I'm really curious what becoming a therapist, quote unquote, is. So you have a blog, but you alluded to other resources as well. I know there's a podcast. Tell, tell me what really is entailed with becoming a therapist. Yeah. So yeah, it just started off as a blog and me trying to just like self-identify, like, what is this going to be? And so it it began with just writing, you know, a couple articles here and there, but kind of figured out pretty quickly that just because if you have have a blog doesn't mean people are going to find you. And so that transitioned into kind of getting more active on Twitter and actually reaching out to other people who are going through a similar thing or people who are down the road from me. And from there, then it morphed into more of like a newsletter where, you know, I can send sort of what I'm writing to people directly and say, hey, every other Friday, I'm going to write about some topic related to becoming a therapist. If that's something valuable to you, you know, you can hang around here and, and that'd be great. 
And then semi-recently, that, that's then morphed into taking what I've been writing about and starting a little podcast around that, letting that be a little bit more long form, a little bit more conversational in that sense. And most recently, and, and I'm still working on this now, but I think could potentially be the most helpful is starting an actual online private community for beginning therapists. So that's been something that I've been kind of building behind the scenes for a month or two now. And I'm, I'm really excited for that because that, that's going to be, I think, a place where other beginning therapists can actually connect more closely, have space to you know, talk through these things together. There's also going to be like a mentorship component of it where therapists who are further along are going to be in that space to connect with them one-on-one, -on -one, do panels, that sort of thing. So I feel like I've been like trying to find my footing of like what is actually valuable to beginning therapists right now. And, and what I've started with the writing podcast seems semi that, but with the community that really feels like that's going to be hopefully like directly impactful, something that can feel a little bit more substantial and valuable in that sense. At least, at least I'm hoping it will be. Yeah. It sounds really great. Honestly, I, I wish there, I knew of something like that when I was at that stage. I mean, I particularly like that idea of having that mentor aspect or maybe not even if it's a formal mentorship, at least resources from therapists who have made it past that burnout stage and, you mm -hmm. know, have succeeded in, in finding a good work-life balance as a therapist. I think that's so helpful to hear during that time when everything mm -hmm. is so overwhelming. It definitely has been ground up. A lot of it is, you know, being a beginning therapist, part of it is also kind of me fighting through my own feelings of self-doubt or, you know, can I help people? But the feedback and, and the connection to people, I think, has been most helpful is, you know, even if I'm just a couple steps ahead of people doesn't necessarily mean I'm an expert, but maybe there's something there to offer, which I think Absolutely. people are responding to. Absolutely. And I think just knowing that people aren't alone in their feelings, because I think after working so hard and investing so many hours and so much money and so much time in a graduate program, and then getting to the end and feeling so drained, it really mm -hmm. can create a big imposter syndrome. And I find that people probably don't really want to talk about it because it's a lot to process. And they think, oh, what if something's wrong with me that I'm the only one feeling this way? But it is actually quite a common time to struggle with all of those. So do you mind sharing a bit more about some of your personal experiences or maybe what you're finding therapists typically feel during this stage? You mentioned imposter syndrome. Anything mm -hmm. else come to mind? I mean, I think that that seems to be sort of the buzzword a lot is imposter syndrome. And I think mm -hmm. that's something I've for sure experienced, you know, right out the gate. And I think it's something that just slowly becomes less and less or easier, but it's something I still experience now. I think especially when I was burnt out, feeling so low energy, that that became all the the more intense where it wasn't just that, you know, I'm worn out and I'm tired, but I'm also questioning, did, did I pick the right field? Is Do I actually have a, the capacity to be doing this, to be seeing a full caseload of clients week after week after week? And, and like you had mentioned before, I think this transition there's so many different factors that are going into making that transition from student to therapist, you know, whether it's, you know, figuring out what kind of theory you're going to focus on, or, you know, the financial side of so many people don't get paid when they're in practicum, and they have kind of this, there's sort of this ingrained sense of, you may not be able to make much after either. And so a lot of people are struggling with the stress that comes with that. And then, once you do graduate, to find any support network can be difficult too, because we're all typically kind of holed up in our offices, seeing clients hour after hour. And so I think, unfortunately, there's just a lot that's really stacked up against beginning therapists that make it difficult to kind of catch their breath and feel like they're doing enough, whether it's professionally, you know, they're growing enough, they're learning enough, or even just one-on-one -on -one with their clients. You know, if you're if you're doubting yourself, it's hard to feel like... The work you're doing is actually good work and it's making a difference. I think sometimes it can be rare to get sort of that feedback from clients too, which is no fault to them. You know, that's not their job. But I think beginning, starting off, that can be really difficult when you're unsure of what what do I even offer? What am I bringing to my clients? So I, I think I, I for sure experienced that, that feeling of just like self-doubt, of feeling like a fraud or imposter of, you know, just making that switch from 
you know, one day you're not a therapist, you don't have any clients on your caseload to suddenly people are coming to you with really personal and intense and, and real problems and asking you to now be, you know, that person there for them. And, and I think it's natural to feel like, wow, this is, this feels like too much, or like, this is really overwhelming, or I don't know what to do. And so I think even like normalizing that for, for people I've noticed of when, when you don't have a lot of people to check in with, when it's just like you and your supervisor checking in week to week, I think it's easy for that to not feel as normal as it really is. Just that sense of this is really difficult work. And you know, so many of us don't have the answer, so to speak, but that doesn't mean you're not a good therapist and doesn't mean that you don't have potential in the field. Yeah. It's, I almost feel like maybe you're articulating the emotional component of the transition from academia to really sitting with people and holding their trauma and their stories, which mm -hmm. is of course what we love. Like that's why we entered the field, but mm -hmm. it feels very different. Right. And I think sometimes the better we are, the more deeply we feel it, which I think is sometimes counterintuitive because maybe not everybody's built that way, but I just mean, there's a lot of empathy that you need to reach clientele and that empathy is draining and it's very different experience going from the supportive structure of having supervisors and colleagues to talk to, to just doing it on your own day in and day out. I also was reflecting too. I, I think there's a lot of personal growth that happens during grad programs, especially a therapeutic graduate program. Cause there's a lot of self-reflection and even just, you know, learning about the theories that we use, we can't help but think about our families and ourselves. And I think sometimes that isn't spoken enough about, there's not enough support around that sometimes of the therapist is probably going through some big personality changes as well, or deep reflections as well, and work on top of helping our clients. So there's just a lot to juggle there, I think is what you're speaking to. For sure. Yeah. I think that second piece you talked about, like the personal development, I think that can kind of get set to the side a lot where there's so much focus on the professional development or the you know, educational piece or, or sort of mastering the theory, ma mastering the you know different techniques, that, that sort of thing. And, and at the same time, you know, when you're trying to develop sort of your professional self, like you're saying th there is, I think sort of this necessary personal growth that you go through where a lot of the work itself, I think can become very personal, where it's like touching on things for ourselves that, you know, may maybe other types of work might not or even up to this point haven't yet. Yeah, I think that can be confusing at first and, and a little chaotic at first when, you know, of course, when people are bringing us their trauma, when they're bringing us their you know, their experiences that that's going to affect us in a certain way. So it seems to be kind of this balancing of figuring out how, how can I be there for my clients while also figuring out how, how can I cope with what this is bringing up for me? How can I deal with, you know, kind of the emotional upheaval or, or fear or doubt or anxiousness that I'm starting to feel being in the room here with them. And at least for me, I felt like a lot of grad school was really focused and, and maybe necessarily focused on like that professional piece of, you know, what can we do for our clients? But I think the majority of the work I've felt like at least these first couple of years has been figuring out how can I get out of the way of like myself here? How can I get out of the way of my clients here so that I can, you know, best serve them. And it, it seems like a lot of what's made it difficult right now is just, yeah, my own experiences of being afraid or being unsure of myself or being anxious or, or feeling these expectations that I need to be, you know, helpful, that I need to make change happen, that I need to meet all the needs of my clients. And that all is just like really complicated work to be doing alongside trying to figure out how to do kind of the, the professional side of the work too. And I guess there isn't like a set line between the two. I think that mixes a lot, but I feel like I've had to do a lot of that work sort of on my own or really kind of struggle through that. And I think that's a piece where a lot of beginning therapists might feel alone or question themselves or wonder, is anyone else dealing with this? Because that is so personal and that is so kind of internal. Yeah. And I think just 
the fact that you're asking those questions and working through that makes you a good therapist, you know, mm-hmm. we not we reach dangerous territory when we don't explore that and manage that and seek support for ourselves with that. Mm-hmm. So again, I think it's wonderful that you're creating a community for people to do just that together. Mm-hmm. I also am reflecting on the time frame because I know you mentioned and and when we were speaking in the intro about COVID and I imagine there's a whole subset of new therapists who are struggling with this so much more than your typical new therapist because they entered the field during COVID because mm-hmm. I'm not that much far ahead of you but I had a few years before COVID to work in the field and I was so hit hard usually we're trained, like you mentioned, to get out of the way, right? To manage our Mm -hmm. own feelings so we can help our clients. And if something hits too close to home, we refer out or we get support, but there's an entire two years where we were going through exactly what all of our clients were going through. And Mm -hmm. it was very difficult emotionally (laughs) to reach Mm -hmm. this deep place where we could support however many people a week when everything they're saying is also what we are struggling with because nobody had been in a pandemic like that before and all of the Mm -hmm. isolation and the anxiety and the stress and the worry and just the toll it took on everybody was very similar even for therapists. So I, I, I imagine that in general, this is a very helpful resource for people, but I, I suspect there's a subset of people in your time frame or around your time frame who are really going to appreciate having this kind of support and are probably struggling a bit more because it typically doesn't feel that heavy when you start out. So starting out in a global pandemic is just, you know, icing on the cake, <laughs> like just hit the <laughs> ground running, figure it out, you know? <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yeah. I think I had, I started the August before COVID hit was when I started my practicum. So I had like five, six-ish months maybe before then it went into full lockdown and we're just doing online and all that. So I had a little bit of a taste of, you know, doing the in-person work and and not having, yeah, that extra layer of, you know, stress and heaviness that the world was experiencing. So I think you're right. I think there's a whole group of us who who had, yeah, that extra weight of you know, you're not only trying to figure out how to do this work now, but you're also doing that in an environment that is unprecedented. And I think one thing that I hesitate to call it a good thing, but part of sort of the stream of marriage and family therapy that I'm in is is we talk about systems a lot and how systems affect individuals and how it affects their, their well-being. And so I think being so embedded, not necessarily in a system, but an environment of stress, of fear, of uncertainty. While yes, it was draining us all the more, I think it did also help in the sense where it was was really easy to empathize with people. You know, it was really easy to have compassion on on people when, you know, when the the fear that they're talking about, the uncertainty they're talking about, the loss that they're talking about is the exact same thing that, you know, that we're going through. And so while that it has been a really difficult way to start, I think it started us with this perspective of you know empathy and compassion that, at least to the degree that we had, it might not have been there without that necessarily. But yeah, I, I do have to wonder. I, I wish there were statistics on you know how many people joined the field that got burnt out and are already done because of COVID. I, I've I've interacted with you know, at least a couple people, a handful of people who have said, yeah, you know, I, I didn't make it through COVID because of how, you know, how much I just need to take care of myself. And I think that's completely legitimate. And at the same time, unfortunate, because I think having a community, having a place where other people are saying, yeah, I'm, I'm really struggling to, I think at least would have been a step in a helpful direction that, that maybe was missed or, or wasn't available there. And I think that's kind of the hope I have for this community is while we're not in the thick of it now, there are, I mean, there's still, you know, a lot of unprecedented things happening and there's still a lot of systemic pressures and stressors happening right now. And and if we can avoid the added heaviness of doing that in an isolation, I think that could definitely be something positive or or hopefully something to to help kind of turn things around for folks who are struggling. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's like that 
you alluded to it earlier, it's like that support is built in during grad school. And then once you're licensed and on your own, you have to go find it. Mm-hmm. But if you're inundated with something like a global pandemic, it's hard to make the time to find that. Um, For sure. Yeah. But I mean, I'm reflecting on my earlier years and I sought out like a consult group and joined a small com- community of like psychologists in the city. And so there are things out there, but I I do feel like I had to be very intentional and put energy forth to find those. And that can be difficult if you're already feeling like you're underwater a bit. Mm-hmm. So I just think it's great. You're creating a, it sounds like very easily accessible, open community that people can use just for that support. Mm-hmm. Are you finding there's certain common themes that people struggle with in this community or specific questions that come up? I know we've shared a little bit about, you know, your experience and, I concur with some of that, but what are you finding with your specific community? What are the main struggles? Yeah, I think one of the loudest things I'm hearing or hearing most often is just the question of when do I start to feel confident? Mm-hmm. Or like, when do I start to kind of settle into this and and feel kind of like, yeah, I've got this or I'm doing well here. I think I think that's definitely tied to sort of that experience of imposter syndrome or, or doubt. And I, I think that's maybe one of the most prevalent feelings or at least pressing feelings. It seems like that that's kind of the fear that keeps coming up is, am I good at this? Am I going to be able to grow in this career and feel like I've, I've got it now and I'm, I'm doing well. And that's been helpful to hear other people voice that. Cause I've definitely felt that and, and do still feel that a lot still. And I think a lot of the responses from therapists and providers who are who have been in the field who have kind of come in and tried to answer that is to to some degree it doesn't fully go away but you know eventually you do get to that point where it's still there in the background but it's not getting in the way so much where where you feel like it's kind of invading the room and 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 you really have to to fight against it and I think I I've started to, to feel that a little bit where you know seeing a new client isn't as nerve wracking as it was before, or seeing a client who's dealing with something that I haven't seen before, or that's not as nerve wracking, or even little things like being more okay with silence or being more okay with not, not always having to to jump in and, and say something. So I think that's, that's one of the most common things I'm, I'm hearing. I think that the second is somewhere around kind of the ballpark of like, how do I actually grow? How, how do I learn how to do this work better? And, and I think one piece of that is, is there's almost like so many options as far as like when it comes to like theories or techniques or interventions or trainings or, or that sort of thing. And so I think, you know, part of what is feeding that is still that fear, that concern of, you know, I'm not confident, I'm not, I'm not good enough, or I'm not doing well. And so then kind of the next question is, well, how do I how do I get confident? How do I get better? How do I grow? And I think that can, yeah, that can be really hard too, because it, you know, we have kind of the paths of each of our licensures, which is helpful to sort of narrow the the field a little bit of, of how we get trained, how we get better. But on like a day-to-day basis, I think a lot of people maybe feel that they're sort of just hopping to the next session and trying to do the best they can, maybe reflecting a little bit on it afterwards, but then just hopping in, you know, right into the next one. And I think that's really understandable because you know, I think there's, yeah, just a lot of pressure to to see your clients and to have a full caseload. So I think that's one thing I've been reflecting on or, or trying to figure out is, is there ways to help kind of guide that growth process or at least have either resources or encouragement that, you know, either saying, Hey, this is what you can do to grow or, Hey, you're doing enough already. Like you're doing great. You're right on track here. You don't have to worry about that. Cause I think that's sort of the spectrum is, you know, never feeling like I'm doing enough or, you know, not actually investing at all in your own growth and, and not knowing where to start. So yeah, I think that, that that's probably the second thing I hear most often. We'll be right back after word from our sponsor. Are you preparing for a licensure exam in psychology, social work, marriage and family therapy, counseling, or behavioral analysis? AATBS is here to help. 
We have been supporting behavioral and mental health students to prepare for their licensure exams for more than 45 years working with over 1 million students to succeed on test day and move on to the next step in their career. With products ranging from comprehensive courses to quiz banks and delivered live online, self-study online, and in print, AATBS has test prep solutions that meet every student's needs and learning styles. Visit us today at aatbs.com. That's aatbs.com and use promo code BHT15 to save 15% off your next purchase. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like trying to figure out what was helpful with the structure of the grad program and carrying that through to quote unquote real life, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's not automatically built in there um, Mm -hmm. and preserving the desire to help because really all of this anxiety is is coming from a desire to be helpful, right? Mm -hmm. So it's preserving that want to help our clients without letting that take over our confidence. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. And I think, you know, we we talked about it a little bit earlier, but there is a huge jump from grad school to private practice life and from being a student to being a clinician full-time. So Mm -hmm. can you share a little bit more about that difficulty and just for our listeners who are like, yes, that's me, <laughs> help them, help them understand what's, what's hard about that and what's normal about that. Yeah. It is such a difficult transition. Um, I kind of think of it in like three sort of stages, which I think are fairly universal, regardless of what license you're getting, but there's, you know, obviously grad school. And then typically you have like a practicum or an internship where you're still in grad school, but you're accruing hours And then once you have enough hours, you graduate and then you're in like the pre-licensure phase of, okay, now I'm accruing hours. I'm studying to take the test. I'm working now. Usually I'm actually getting paid now. And then after that, sort of it's somewhat freedom, you know, beyond that where you're not in this process of getting licensed. So from the grad school phase to, to practicum, I think you know, the obvious first and I think scariest hurdle for a lot of people is seeing that first client, that that feels like the biggest jump from, you know, maybe we did some practice sessions in in grad school and maybe we, we saw our professor see some clients, but we weren't actually in the chair. We weren't sitting there yet. And I will forever um, remember my first client. I remember sweating, driving to the community (laughs) clinic and it was literally just one client, one client, but I will always remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Everyone does. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Same here. And there's something about that that is just such like a switch of like, oh my gosh, this is official now. Almost like it's too late to stop now. You're sort of being pushed into it, which it's scary. It's nerve wracking. I think part of that, like you can't avoid, like that's going to be there and that's okay. And so I I think that's the first hurdle. And and I think I I would just want to reassure, I guess, anyone who's hasn't hit that yet or is about to hit that change that everyone experiences that same level of fear and uncertainty everyone's as prepared as they can be and still unprepared in a sense for that so i I think that that's kind of the the first place of difficulty that people hit and i think even in that, that that can be staggered sometimes like for my practicum we like got handed clients right away and my supervisor wasn't in the room. There wasn't a two-way mirror. It was just me and my client, which was incredibly frightening at first, but I was kind of thankful for that, that it wasn't this gradual process of, you know, watching my supervisor and then doing co-therapy and and that sort of thing. I think that might build up kind of the nerves a little bit. So I I think that first client is definitely kind of the the first place of difficulty we, we hit. I think sort of what happens after that, at least what I experienced was a lot of what I was getting supervision on, a lot of what I was hearing was, you know, just make it through your first session, you know, just listen, be warm, instill some sense of hope, and just make it through that. And then we'll talk about what what to do next. But I think what we do next after that is then just this huge sort of chasm of my client came back, that's great, but now they're still sitting here wanting me to do something about this or, or expecting me to to help in a certain way. 
and I think that's when sort of the the next kind of stage of fear kicks in of I think that's when a lot of the doubt kicks in and then a lot of that urgency of okay I really need to kick into high gear here I really need to grow quick so that I can help these clients so that I can fix their problems and I, and I remember you know bringing my textbooks to the office and before sessions like picking a theory picking an intervention and just hoping that like I, can, I could incorporate that some way or that that would work but I think what eventually started to take place was that you know a lot of the advice for the first session of just being there just listening, being mindful of what you're experiencing, what you're feeling, being warm, being compassionate, being human, not trying to force anything. Like, I think a lot of that started to bleed into the next stage and it seemed like, oh, my clients are reacting really well when I embody kind of those same things that I tried to do that first session. And I think that became sort of at least sort of a, a little safe haven of, okay, I can try to do that better. I can try to be better at being present. I can try to be better at not, you know, just feeling the silence to fill the silence. I can try to be better at expressing and showing warmth and compassion. Cause that's all stuff that I already kind of knew how to do beforehand. I think everyone who sort of joins the field has at least an inherent sense of being a helpful or a warm type of person. And behind that has that desire to help. And I think a lot of times that we just feel like that's not enough that we need to have, you know, fancy skills or, or techniques or things to be that kind of special sauce that fixes everyone's problems. And sometimes the clients expect that, right? And I think that's part sure. of the, uh, I guess, psychoeducation around therapy too, is that I think as helpers, we need to remind ourselves, at least I had to all the time of like, that's their life. It's not my life. And mm -hmm. our program, they taught us, you can't work harder than your client. So you can mm -hmm. show up as much as you can, but ultimately it's, it's the responsibility is on them, not us. And I think as helpers, it's easy to put that pressure on ourselves, especially as new therapists. Cause there's, mm -hmm. like you mentioned, there's literally an actual human being <laughs> sitting so close to you, sharing and trusting you with very deep information. It's honoring, but it you want to help so badly that sometimes you can't think clearly. And I think that's mm -hmm. part of the adjustment from student to therapist is mm -hmm. trusting the process, as they say. In our program, they said the goal of the first session is to have a second session. So I was laughing when you said they came back because that's a good first <laughs> session. <laughs> and then that second phase you're talking about where you're like, okay, now what? Like, what if I run out of skills or what if I don't know mm -hmm. everything? Or, you know, there obviously there's a lot of interventions that you want to learn and can use and you want to be doing something. It's not that you don't have a treatment plan, but mm -hmm. all the research shows the most important thing that helps people is actually the relationship. So our program always taught us, okay, even though you have all these, this, these skills you're going to learn, you can always learn more bottom line. It's the connection. And so I think that's what you're mm -hmm. speaking to. We're just quieting down and staying connected to that person and really hearing them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I appreciate what you said about that sense that, yeah, our, our clients do come in with a lot of expectations too, of what yeah. the work is going to look like. And, and they're I think stressed that, out. They want help, you know? Yeah. yeah, of course. And I think that that can be difficult because at least for me, it was easy to sort of turn into a yes person of like, oh, yes, of course I can meet all of your expectations. Right. Of course, since you have these expectations for me, okay, I guess it's on me now to to do this. Yeah. And yes, there should be a certain level of expectation that, you know, they're, they're coming to us for help or, or there should be a sense of change. But at the same time, I think one of the biggest things I had to learn my first year was understanding what my limits actually are of like, what, what can I actually offer here and what's beyond my scope of practice? What's beyond what I can actually offer? And can I be okay expressing that? Can I be okay saying, you know, hey, th this is what I can do here for you. This is what we can do together. And then being okay with what, what I can't do or what, what isn't possible. And that's really hard because when you're just starting, like, you know, you write your bio for your website or whatever and say, oh, you know, that's person like centered that's or so I'm, yeah. <laughs> and, and you, and you kind of fill it with all the filler of what you learned in grad school, of what you think you might offer, but you don't have like a felt embodied sense of like, 
when you come to my office, this is what I'm going to offer for you. This is what you can expect. And that's such a vulnerable place, I think, for new therapists to... Because that takes time. It takes time to develop that. Yeah. For sure. I think that's what a lot of new therapists feel really vulnerable about and feel uncertain about is saying, you know, th this is what I offer, but I'm not sure how I'm going to offer this to you. I'm not sure mm -hmm. what this is going to look like. And I, I think sort of discerning or making, getting a better understanding as you go along of, you know, this is what I can offer. This isn't what therapy is, or this is what therapy is. This isn't what therapy with me looks like. That Yeah, like you said, that just takes time to develop and understand. And that's okay to not have that like full assurance day one. Of, yes, that's exactly what, what I, I was going to say. Yeah, it's making me, maybe I'm ignorant about this topic, but I'm wondering if there are any theories or research out there about the development of a therapist. And it's reminding me almost of our, you know, child development theories where mm -hmm. certain ages, the question is literally like, am I capable? Can I do this? And mm -hmm. I feel like that's the, the first client stage. And then the second one is like, okay, but like, how far can I do this? And how do mm -hmm. I do this well? And maybe that could be something to include in your community is just general mm -hmm. knowledge of here are the stages that most therapists go through as they reach this point of more confidence. Because mm -hmm. to your point, I think we put pressure on ourselves because we're graduated, we're licensed, we've done it, right? We're supposed to be great. But really, mm -hmm. it's an ever-evolving process, just like any other career. The more hours you put in, the more expertise you have, and the more comfortable you are. And so I think taking that pressure off a new therapist to be acting like a someone who's been licensed for 20 years, you know, you, you really mm -hmm. don't have to be at that stage immediately. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. Obviously, you really want to help people because you're not only helping your clients, but you created this whole community to help therapists as well. Do you have a story that comes to mind of someone who was really helped by your community or your blog or your podcast? There's like specific people I've heard from. I'd say it's more more like a joint sentiment, of like a conglomerate mm -hmm. of a lot of people that I've heard from. And I think one of the biggest things has been thank you for seeing me, you know, thank you for mm. speaking to this. And we've talked about this already, but I don't know if it's just that sense of isolation or that sense of comparison or self-doubt or whatever it is, but it seems like there, there's a lot of us folks that really do feel like this is an individual experience, or this is just me going through this, or there's something wrong with me, or there's something not good enough about me or the work that I do. So I, I think that was kind of surprising at at first because that was just coming from me expressing, hey, this is what I've gone through or this is what I'm going through right now. And I wasn't offering any like answers to that or I wasn't saying, hey, this is how you get out of it or this is how you get through it. it so just... ironically, it's what we were just talking about, about how just showing up mm -hmm. and being there is actually what's helpful, right? It's like a parallel yeah. process. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> You're a good therapist. <laughs> Thanks. That's why people pay me. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, but it's just because I'm listening to you say it. So mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it's, it's the same thing. It sounds like I'm sure there are people that are significantly helped by your community, but yeah, it sounds like what people need at that stage is just to know they're not alone and to have someone else to talk to about it and potentially mm -hmm. some resources, but really just knowing this is a normal part of the process. Mm -hmm. in a normal stage to be in. And that takes a lot of the anxiety away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think the flip side of that is I, I have tried to outline a little bit of like how I've grown or like what I've done to feel a little bit more confident or what I've done to kind of excel my craft or, or whatever you want to call it. And I think that then on the flip side too is, oh, thank you for sharing at least some like kind of stepping stones or some totally. place to start at least. So I think there, yeah, there's that balance of just showing up and expressing what I've been experiencing and also trying to have some practicals or have some to do's or some, here's how I did it to float out there at least as, Hey, maybe try this or, yeah. And I think even if that doesn't like work or even if that doesn't fit their experience or isn't completely helpful, I, I think at least it gives a sense of ease of th there's something I can do. There's something I can try and, and Beyond that, then hopefully that at least sparks some curiosity of, okay, if this didn't work, what what's something adjacent to this that I could try or, or what's something like this that might work a little bit better for me? Yeah. And I don't know about you, but I would much rather have a therapist who 
is trying and learning and, you know, working on this stuff than someone who has a false sense of confidence. So Mm -hmm. I hope your, your community can keep that message and hold that for each other. They're Mm -hmm. probably doing so much better than they think they are just because Mm -hmm. they're seeking out that support, you know? Mm -hmm. Sure. Is there any message as we wrap up that you might want to leave with early career practitioners who are listening? I think just speaking to what I've heard, and obviously this isn't for everyone, but I think for the majority, having more gentleness on ourselves, I think having more compassion for ourselves never hurts. And I think that's something that typically as helpers, we're, we're so others focused and like others oriented that, you know, ironically, we can leave ourselves kind of in the dust or we can forget about ourselves a lot. And especially when you're just starting out, when you when you feel that immense pressure of I've got to be good enough, or I've got to show up for my clients, I have to make it happen, I have to make it work. I think it, it so easily we kind of leave our, ourselves to the side and, and forget or just even are in tune with what we're experiencing. So I, I think one practical thing would just be to allow yourself to have one time a week to sit down and ask yourself, you know, how am I being affected by this work? You know, what what was happening in me? You know, maybe in my toughest session this week, what was going on with that? Mm-hmm. What was I feeling? How did I take that with me throughout the week? And then moving into like, what do I need? What what am I longing for? What would be helpful here? So kind of have supervision with yourself. Sure. Yeah. 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 I right. think for sure that. And then, you know, hopefully that can be something that then we bring to to other people, whether it's yes. your supervisor or there's a certain level of distance we have from our family and friends because we can't bring everything to them. But I think we can still bring what we're feeling, mm-hmm. you know, what we're going through, what we're needing. And I think at, at least prioritizing vocalizing that rather than internalizing all of that was at least helpful for me when I started to make that switch. And I think you're right. You said it earlier that we just get so busy. It's easy to go from one session to the next. And I think Mm -hmm. for me, it was the same, very helpful. I had to carve out, I basically scheduled a session with myself once a week, Mm -hmm. at least sometimes if it was a busy week, maybe like two a week, where maybe I didn't eat lunch or like lay on my couch or whatever, but I had to think through what am I doing with these cases and these people? And it Mm -hmm. helped me organize. Okay. This one's okay. Oh, I need to print something for this one. Oh, this one. I really need consultation around. Let me, let me text somebody right now and schedule a time to consult. And so I think that structure was very helpful for me as well as just making some time to do what we used to do in school, which is slow down, Mm -hmm. reflect, figure out what we need to do for our clients and then leave it and go home, you know? Mm -hmm. So I like that advice quite a bit. Yeah. Well, we're coming to a close with our time today, but I would really love for you to share with our listeners some resources of where they can find your website, Becoming a Therapist, and if you have any upcoming plans for your online community. Yeah, for sure. So the website, which is kind of the hub for any of these resources I have, it's becomingatherapist.me, M-E. And so there you can find like where to sign up for the newsletter where to find the podcast. And then eventually when the community is live, there'll be a like a portal for that as well. So if you want to like stay up to date on when the community is going to be launching, I'm going to start by sending anyone who's subscribed to the newsletter kind of an opportunity to jump on it early. So that'd be the best way to stay up to date with that. There isn't necessarily like a set timeline for when the community is going to launch, but I'm hoping it's going to be within a month or two here for sure by by the new year. So yeah, just getting really excited for that. I'm talking to mentors at this point right now who are going to be part of the community. We're going to be there to to walk alongside those of you who are beginning therapists. And I think that's going to be an excellent resource. So that's the other thing. If you are kind of a more experienced therapist and want to be a mentor, I'm also looking for more folks for that as well. So you can find the the newsletter there and, and then just reach out by email and, and get in touch with that. But yeah, really excited for it. Hoping it can be something beneficial for, for beginning therapists here. I'm sure it will. I'm, I'm excited for that to launch too. And 
I just want to thank you for your vulnerability. I mean, you know, you didn't have to share all of that, but I, I think it was really nice to hear your experience. And I'm sure so many of our listeners relate to what you're saying, because I know I do. So thank you so much for being here today and, and letting us know about this amazing community that you're creating. Yeah, of course. Thanks so much for having me. It's been, yeah. it's been great talking with you. Good. I also want to remind our listeners that this episode, its resources, and all of our other shows can be found on our webpage at triadhq.com slash BHT. Visit triadhq.com slash BHT today and explore our archive. And finally, we want to thank you, our listeners, for joining in on the conversation. We appreciate you being here with us and look forward to having you back with us next time on Behavioral Health Today. We appreciate all the support from our community. And if you like our show, one of the best ways you can support it is by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review. Behavioral Health Today is a podcast part of the Tribe Network, all rights reserved.